Hello, wizards. Today, I'm going to show you how to find trends and build heuristics using data analysis with GTO Wizards' most powerful tool, Aggregate Reports. What are aggregate reports? Well, in my opinion, these are the most underutilized features in GTO Wizard. So an aggregate report contains data from all 1755 strategically distinct flops. They're used to build bet sizing trends and heuristics. In today's lecture, we're going to go over how to use aggregate reports. We're going to look at how to play different flop textures, how to break it down by different textures, how to follow through on the turn. And this lecture is applicable to all formats, whether you play cash, MTT, spin and go, heads up, you name it, this lecture is for you. Aggregate reports are some of the most powerful tools in GTO Wizard. Now, back in the day, if you wanted to do aggregate reports, you'd have to run all the flops yourself, compile the data yourself, export it to a spreadsheet, and build an entire interface just to try and extract data. GTO Wizard's interface makes it much easier to find trends and look for the bigger picture. In today's lecture, I'm going to start off with a guide how to use aggregate reports. We're going to show you how to get the most out of it, how to use these tools, including all the niche features that a lot of people don't know about. From there, I'm going to teach you how to find flop heuristics. We're going to go over systematic approaches that involve writing stuff down. And lastly, I'm going to teach you how to focus on follow through and turn those heuristics into practical skill. Let me take you through my four step plan. The first step is to master the tools. We're going to learn how to use all of the interesting and niche features that you may or may not know about already. We're going to go over everything from flop to turn reports, how to use it, how to filter and how to group so that you can become an expert with this tool. Step two, we're going to talk about how to find trends. Now, when you're searching for big trends, you are trying to optimize two goals. One, find filters that result in strategically similar flops. And two, we want those filters to apply to a wide range of flops. If you get too niche, then all of a sudden, you know, you end up with just hundreds or hundreds of filters that are impossible to apply. And if you get too broad, then the boards aren't strategically similar enough. So our goal is to group boards together that are strategically similar so that we can learn more easily going forward. Step three, we're going to write it down. Remember kids, the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. Quote by Adam Savage. So I'm going to show you a systematic approach to studying flops by recording your observations in a spreadsheet or document. I'll provide you with a template you can use, but the important thing is that you're trying to build it yourself. I'm not going to give you the heuristics, rather I'm going to teach you how to find them yourselves because let's face it, most of the learning actually occurs with the discovery process in doing this yourself. Lastly, we're going to learn how to focus on follow through. So step four is practice, practice, practice. Now playing turns and rivers accurately is more important than optimizing flop sizing, right? We can use turn reports to get a sense of the strategy on how to continue on some board in some line. And similarly, we can take our discovered heuristics, plug them into the trainer, and then use those settings to practice strategically similar boards. So that's the four step plan. Let's start with step one, mastering the tools. I'm gonna now walk you through everything there is to know about aggregate reports. Let me dive right into the reports and start with a tour of the software. All right, so how do we use aggregate reports? So first of all, you need to select some spots and I'm just going to choose simplest spot, some button versus big blind thing in there going to go flops and check. Now, what we're looking at here contains data from all 1755 strategically distinct flops. In the top right here, we can see the global betting frequencies. So this contains data for how button should bet across all different flops. We can see it contains about 50% checking, some small betting, some medium betting, some large betting, some over betting. At the bottom here, we see a breakdown of all the possible flops. And right now it's sorted by uh, high cards. So ace high flops, king high flops, queen high flops, and so on. And you can click this and drag through or just use your mouse wheel to scroll. And you can see the strategy on different flops. 
If I hover over any one of these, it's going to show the individual strategy for this specific flop in the corner here. So 10, 7, 5, we can see the overall betting strategy for button in this spot. I can also click all, and that's going to show me things like the overall expected value, equity, and equity realization. If I want to study particularly this flop, I can hit this button and that's going to open up a new tab that shows me how to play 1075. But remember, this lecture is about finding the global betting frequency. So I'm not so much interested in one board as I am interested in finding trends. Now at the top here, we can see different groupings. So for example, I can group by high card. Now I'm looking at all of the ace high flops grouped together, king high flops, queen high flops, jack high flops, and so on. You can also group by suits. And here, for example, we can see that monotone boards tend to use a smaller bet and check a lot more often compared to rainbow or flush drop boards. There's also pairing. So here we can see that paired and triple uh, flops tend to be bet a lot more often. And again, typically using a smaller size on these paired boards. And of course, connectedness. So I should mention connected means a straight is immediately possible, open-ended straight draw possible, and disconnected meaning no open-ended straight draws or straights are currently possible. Now there's two ways to view reports. You can either view it as a chart or as a table. And they both have their pros and cons. Now, the table acts very similarly to a spreadsheet. You can sort by any column. So for example, I can find which boards use this overbet size the most, or which boards check the most, which ones are the highest expected value for in position or out of position. Now, personally, I prefer chart mode for most uses, but I do like the table mode sometimes when I'm trying to look at exact numbers. Next, we can group actions together. And this is one of the advantages of table mode I'll show you. So let's go back to table mode. And here, let's say I want to find, let's put in some bet, we'll say 33%. And we want to find the most check raised flop. Now I could sort by the most 50% check raised flop or the most pot size check raised flop. But what if I want both of these together? Well, I can group these together. And now it's split up into fold, call, and raise. And I can sort it this way to find the most check raised flop, which in this spot appears to be nine, nine deuce. So something else you can try are filters. Filters are great. Filtering, I'm just gonna go back to button here. This is what we're gonna be focusing on the most this lecture. When it comes to the study of flop textures, there's various ways you can break it down. Most systematic approaches can break it down by suits, pairing, connectedness, and rank. So for example, here we could choose flush draw, Broadway card, low card, low card. That is one filter you can apply. And here we can find a set of flops that only fit those filters. And notice that these global betting frequencies up here update to reflect our filtering. And this is what most of the lecture is going to be about, finding strategically similar flops like this one. Now, in here, I'm going to switch it back to table mode. And you can always hit W. So I'll be using W from now on, just as a hotkey. And I want you to pay attention to one little number in here that's quite useful. This is the filtered percentage. What does this mean? This means that within the filters we've applied, 4.8% of flops meet those filters, right? And so again, remember our goal. One is to find strategically similar flops. The other is to find filters that apply to a relatively wide variety of flops. Now, how specific or how wide you want your filtering to be, that's up to you. So I'm going to switch back. Now, something else you can try is instead of looking at strategy, 
you can look at expected value or equity or equity realization. So for example, here we can look at buttons expected value across various flops. And let's group those together by high card. I'm going to clear these filters. And of course, we can see that ace high flops are going to be among the highest EV flops for buttons range next to only two high flops, which is like just two, 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 right? We can also look at big blind at the exact same time. So again, big blind tends to have higher EV with these middling flops. Now, Sometimes it can be a little hard to tell what's going on with this because a lot of boards run close. So again, we can just switch to table mode, right? And here we can see highest EV flops in position, out of position. And note that I've got this sorted by high cards, right? So ace high flops, king high flops, queen high flops, and so on. Now, something else I want to point out are these numbers in this column here. A lot of people... When they three bet, for example, king, king, they'll think, oh, I always see an ace on the board when I have king, king. And something to realize here is, well, yeah, that's because ace high flops are more common than king high flops are more common than queen high flops and so on. In fact, the chances of getting a seven high flop is only 4% and the chances of getting an ace high flop is 21%, right? So let's go back. Like I said, you can sort by expected value, equity for one or both players, as well as equity realization. Now, I'll show you the one feature that I think most people use a ton, and that is the sorting feature. So for example, let's try and find the most checked flop. So from this dropdown, sort by, I'm going to click check. And I'm going to drag it to the right. And here we can see these are among the most checked flops. So it appears to be ace high monotone is where button should be checking the most, presumably because your fold equity is just terrible on these boards. And we can also do stuff like, for example, which boards are betting the most. Now you can, for example, use a smaller size here. And I can click this again to reverse the order. And it appears that paired boards, specifically paired boards, the Broadway card are bet at a high frequency using a small size. What if we want to see the most overbet flops? Okay, well, I'm going to now sort by bet 125%. And here we can see that Ace Broadway Brick tends to be an overbet or check strategy, right? So let's test that heuristic. I'm going to plug in ace, Broadway, brick, and it's not going to be monotone. It's not going to be paired. And now note the top right. We're seeing a lot more overbets, high frequency checks, and not a lot of these middling sizes, right? So this is what I would classify as a set of strategically similar boards. I'm going to dive more into that in just a minute. First, I want to show you the rest of the features in these reports. So again, you can use a combination of sorting, filtering, and grouping to find trends and heuristics that are going to make your flop strategies much easier. And it doesn't just have to be for the initial C bet. It can also be, for example, for the raise, right? It can be for how often you should check raise, how big you should check raise which boards you should just be overfolding a ton on as the defender. So remember, it's not just about the initial bet here. We can also, for example, look at which boards are donked the most, right? Now, that's mostly it for the aggregate reports, right? That's basically all of the features in there. There's a few more smaller features I could show you. For example, here in this table, you can click this little S, small, medium, large, to expand these rows. This is better if you have, for example, a smaller screen or just terrible eyesight like me. <laughs> and again, any filters you apply, for example, you could look at paired boards are going to update the filtering criteria. Now, this first row, 
button versus big blind, we can see the global betting frequency. So this is everything. Now, the second row are only the filters we've applied, right? So we can see just by comparing these two boxes that when I've applied paired flops, we're betting more often, checking less often, and typically using a smaller size, almost never over betting paired flops, right? So again, this is a nice, easy way to see how the strategy changes compared to baseline when you apply some filtering. You can also see at the bottom here, 16.9% of flops fit our criteria, which are paired. So this many flops are paired. All right, so next I'm going to show you how to use turn reports. So they're very similar to flop reports. I'll just put in some random flop here, plug in the strategy. All right, so let's put in some small bet, big blind calls. And I can select the turn card or I can simply press turns. And again, I love using turn reports because I want to get that global view of what's going on rather than uh, just clicking through cards one at a time. All right, so here's the turn report. Now, given that we have this flop and we've taken this line, third pot bet call, this is the follow up strategy. And so the first thing I do when I look at this is I try and sort it in a way that makes sense. So here you can sort it by suits, actions, or cards. Actions meaning, you know, bet the most to bet the least. And cards, I think, is going to make the most sense for a rainbow board, right? Here we can see that, for example, on a seven or an eight, it's typically overbetting. And again, on the right hand side, we can see the global betting frequencies, right? So here we can see that. For example, we're going to follow this up with a large bet quite often. And I can just group these together. For example, let's group like this over bet, bet large, bet medium, rarely ever using another small bet, except, for example, on a paired second card. Now, in the turn reports, there are a couple other interesting things you can try. So, for example, the filtering works a little bit differently here. Instead of filtering for some flop, you can filter for a specific whole card. So how should we play when we have ace king of diamonds as an example? And here we can see the strategy for ace king of diamonds, as well as the EV equity and equity realization. As you can see, ace king is tends to check a lot on any 10 jack or queen. And we tend to bet a lot on most other cards, sizing down on paired cards like a nine or a three, and overbetting on the rest, try and get the most value. Again, you can view the strategy, the expected value for one or both players, the equity or equity realization. You can also group turn cards together. So I've got this on turns, but we could put it on cards, for example. And now we just see two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is probably easier for rainbow boards, but less effective for flush draw boards. We can also use suits. This is quite useful for flush draw boards and pairing. So again, we can see that it starts sizing down on many of the paired cards, right? Now there's an extra view here that a lot of people don't know about. So with turn reports, again, we've got the table view, we've got the chart view. And this operates just as any other spreadsheet would, same as before. But then we've got this default view, which is very similar to what other products you might have seen, like, uh, for example, PO or GTO Plus. And I like this view particularly for looking at numbers, and I'll show you why. If I want to see, for example, what is the highest EV turn card in buttons range? Not a trick question, guys. I'm just... I just pulled up a random spot here. It's probably ace, right? <laughs> so let's find out. I'm going to click button. And what I'm going to do now is group by cards. And I'm going to sort by cards. And here we can see ace is indeed the highest EV turn for button. And we can see the actual expected value here rather than a graph, right? And again, I can view this for one or both players. We can also look at, for example, the highest equity card, the bottom being button, 
the top being big blind. And of course, equity realization. So I'm going to be using um, a combination of almost every feature I've shown you so far in order to move on to the next part. So let's go back here. Okay. So how do we find trends? How do we find heuristics? How do we actually use all these features to accomplish our goals? A few examples of how we can use these reports to find trends. And I'm going to show you some simple ones that a lot of you will already know and some more complex ones. All right. So again, I'm going to choose the NL500 solutions. You can choose whatever you like. Now, sometimes, for example, you'll run into a spot where you just don't have reports at the moment, right? So I don't think these have reports right now. And you'll get this message. Now, not every spot has a report, but some do. So what I recommend you try is switch between the type of solution and the rake structure in order to find uh, a spot that works. Now, we're always adding reports on the go, and we're always adding more solutions and sometimes updating those solutions. Uh, the end goal is to have solutions or reports for every possible spot, but it does take time, guys. So just so you know about that, let's dive into the simplest spot button versus big blind again, and we'll look at some more complex spots later. So let's go over how you can find very simple trends. So for example, we see that across all flops, big blind is donk betting in this spot about 4.1% of the time. Let's try to isolate this. So what are we trying to do? We want to isolate the donk bet heuristic. So our goal is to find a set of filters where Big blind donks a ton. So how do we do this? Well, let's find the most bet spot. So I'll click that once, twice. All right. So what do we see here? 653, 754, 532, 753. Okay. So lots of low cards. Now, the first thing you can try, for example, is just looking at high cards. And we can see that all of these low cards here are where we bet most often. Okay. What about connectedness? Oh, so we see that connected boards tend to be high frequency donk bets. Okay. Okay. So we're starting to get an idea here. Let's try a filter. So I'm going to filter starting off with just low cards, right? And we're going to make this more precise as we go. Okay. So we've already increased this from like Four point something percent to twenty three percent. So this is already a high frequency dog, but we can make it cleaner. So notice that this includes some tripled boards, which are never donk bet. Uh, some paired boards, which are very low frequency donk bet. So, okay, let's get rid of that. So we're going to say not paired, and we've increased this further. So now it's at twenty eight percent, right? And there's still some low frequency stuff. So something else we can try is making it connected. Now, most of these boards are already kind of connected because they're close together. Now we've increased it to 32%. So we've got a pretty strong heuristic at this point. If you wanted to make it even stronger, you could throw out these monotone boards at the bottom, which are low frequency donk bets, right? So we can throw that out. We can say, all right, it's not monotone. And any connected board or any connected flop cannot be paired, so that doesn't actually matter. So again, the heuristic is all the cards are less than a seven. There's a straight possible, and it's not monotone. That's our heuristic. That's the thing we have to try and remember, and that's the thing we want to practice. Now we can see here that this is a pretty strong heuristic. Most flops are not donk bet, but this set of conditions is a high frequency donk bet, right? If we go over to the table mode, we can see that we're getting a little specific here. So about 4.3% of flops this applies to. But the donk bet is already low frequency. So this is to be expected, right? Now, this is a pretty strong heuristic. So ultimately, the goal is to maximize the amount of flops this applies to. And again, keep in mind that if it's a something that doesn't happen that often, you're not going to get that many flops. But at the same time, you want strategically similar flops. Now, a lot of you guys will already know this. It's fairly straightforward. To, for example, if you want to find the most overbet boards like we did earlier, 
just click this once, twice. Oh. And you can see the most overbet boards and just guesstimate a heuristic from here, right? You can also do the same thing for, for example, if you just want to look at pairing, we can say, oh, look at that paired boards bet at a very high frequency. You could do the same for tripled boards, but this accounts for very few flops. So let's try a new filter. I'm going to go with paired flops. As we can see, paired boards tend to bet quite often and typically using a smaller size, not a ton of overbetting going on, lots of small sizes, right? High frequency bet, small size. Now, something to keep in mind whenever you're making heuristics is that just because it applies in one spot does not mean it applies in all spots. For example, in a button versus small blind three bet pot, paired boards are often larger bets as opposed to smaller bets because you're targeting a different portion of their range. If you're looking at, for example, just these overbet boards, that's going to change if you're looking at early position versus big blind, where big blind actually calls things like ace king, right? And so keep in mind that your heuristics do not universally apply to all position pairs and preflop actions. This is specifically for button versus big blind. Now that said, you can often group stuff together. So for example, hijack versus big blind and under the gun versus big blind play very similarly because the ranges are very similar. And so while it doesn't have to be perfect, you do have to try and test your heuristics against different positional pairs for it to make sense. Now that said, I want to show you guys how we can take a more systematic approach rather than just sorting by some size and guessing, right? And this is perhaps the most important thing because, well, looking at the actions is maybe one part of it. Actually starting to write it down and building yourself a system is the difference between just slacking off and really intentional practice that's going to improve your game. So the next step is to record your observations in some sort of spreadsheet or document. Uh, now, how you do this is not that important. What actually matters is just that you are recording it. So I'll show you a spreadsheet here. Looks like this. I can share this template with you guys. One of my students actually improved on it and I kind of took theirs a little bit and modified it. So. Shout out to him. He knows who he is. So in here, basically what happens is I've broken down all of these. So on this side, we've got positions, preflop action, stack depth. Here we've got the filters. Now I should mention that GTO Wizards next update will allow you to save filters. And that's going to be really useful because once you build your heuristics, you'll be able to save all those filters and reuse them in different spots. For now, I'm just writing it down. So high card, middle card, low card, uh, the suits, pairing and connectedness. And there's just little drop downs here. For example, uh, if you want it to be not monotone, you could just pick rainbow plus flush draw. If you want it to be connected, you can pick connected. On the right hand side, we've got a spot where you can take notes. So here I've noted down the trainer. Now you can save your filters as a drill in the trainer and then paste that link here. Here I've just exported the actual drill so that, for example, you can share it with friends, but you could also paste the URL if you just want to dive in yourself. I've noted the filter percentage. So this indicates what percentage of flops this applies to. And Uh, this indicates the primary flop strategy and some notes here. And again, this is flexible. If you want to find a different way, that's fine. Now, things like stack depth become a lot more important, for example, in MTTs, where the strategy can change quite a bit between 100 big blinds and 10 big blinds, right? So it's important to note stuff like this down. And similar story in spins. Now, note that sometimes I'll put something like early position versus big blind, and sometimes I'll use exact spots like small blind versus button, three bet pots, right? 
there's a ton of different heuristics we can try out here. Now, again, I'm going to share this spreadsheet with you guys uh, just as an empty template so you guys can fill it out yourself and build your own heuristics. This lecture is about teaching the man how to fish rather than giving them the fish. I'm not going to tell you how you should simplify, right? That's up to you. I've got a whole video on the trade-offs between complexity and simplification. You can go watch the efficient studying video if that's interesting to you. But the truth is that a lot of these heuristics we've covered so far, they are one sizing or check, right? Very, very basic. But your heuristics can get much more complex. And so something I've added here are called textures to try out. And this is based on Munker generated textures. The way Munker does this is it looks for flops that result in strategically similar hand categories based on their, their equity distribution by the river. At least that's how my colleague explained it to me. And you can choose how many different textures you want. And so, for example, all of these flops would be considered one texture. All of those flops would be considered one texture. And this is based on a range of any two cards. Some of these are really strong. Some of these will produce very strategically similar strategies. Some of them, not so much, right? It really depends on the spot you're looking at because these Munker textures just assume a range of any two cards. They're not designed for some specific set of ranges, right? And that's why sometimes it can be really strong and other times not so much. So I've got three of them here, 30 textures, which are quite coarse, 60, and then 100, which are quite fine. So you can scroll through these, play around with them, and use them as inspiration to look for a new heuristic. Again, I want to make sure that this lecture is available for all users. So it shouldn't just be for cash. As I said, if you play MTTs, if you play spins, you can also use this method. So let's start with a few MTT spots. I'm going to switch over to MTT now. Got to give the tourney players some love. Can't all be cash, right? And let me go look up some heuristics I've already found here just to be a bit lazier. So let's, for example, apply early position versus big blind. So we'll say maybe under the gun versus big blind. Now, the first thing to note actually is that under the gun and under the gun plus one strategy, very similar, you know, 2% difference. And the same with big blinds calling range, very similar. So you can group some of these early positions together and just call it, you know, most of your heuristics for one will apply to the other, right? Um, you don't have to be that exact. Again, I can just click reports or press four to go to the reports tab. Check. Okay, so in tournaments, due to the ante, big blind must call much wider, and that's going to result in a huge range inequality on most flops that causes under the gun to range bet, right? We can see here across all flops under the gun, only checking about 12% of the time. But that's a little misleading because on a lot of flops, it's a range bet, and on other flops, it's a high frequency check. So let's try to isolate where we should be checking a lot, right? I'm going to start by just sorting by high card. And okay, okay, so we can already see kind of these five through nine boards are the ones that are just checking a ton, right? So let's apply a very simple filter, right? Again, I'm noticing that these boards are all range bets, ace through 10. So very simply, I'm going to plug in ace through 10. And we can see the betting frequency is already up to almost 100%, right? Let's go look for other heuristics in here. And okay, we, we noticed that there are some spots where we're not range betting. So let's organize this by the most checked boards. And notice that in this spot, it's all of these paired boards. Specifically, no, just mostly paired boards. All right, well, let's go back to grouping and let's sort by pairing. And again, we can see paired boards in this spot are doing the most checking, right? So this is kind of backwards from what you might see as an MTT, as a cash player, I should say. So let's apply another filter here. Again, we've got one Broadway card and not paired or tripled. I guess you can also plug in tripled. Okay. And now 
very, very high frequency range bet. And I would already say that these boards are strategically similar, at least for the first node, right? At least in the sense that you're basically range betting. Now you can get more specific. You can break it down by which boards are we betting larger on, which ones are we betting smaller on. Um, but for at least the C bet node, you've already identified a very simple heuristic unpaired with a Broadway card, early position versus big blind, essentially a range bet for the first node, right? That's a very easy heuristic to remember. And if we go to table, you can see that this applies to 66% of flops. So two thirds of the time, you already have your first action just automated, right? So let's go back here. And again, we're going to type this in. So we've got early position versus big blind, 30 big blinds effective, ace through 10 and not paired, 66%. And let's type in what our primary flop strategies are. So it's a range bet in position, right? So let's go on to spins and do one more example there. And then to end off the lecture, I'll show you uh, how you can create your own drills using these filters. So got to give the spin players some love. I'll just use the 25 big blind stacks. We'll say button opens, big blind calls, and we'll just click flops to open up the reports. I'll go to chart mode, which is how I prefer to look at stuff. And let's ungroup this. So now we see all the bet sizes, right? All right. So let's go back, actually. Not a whole lot of donk betting. We could do something that captures the donk bets, but we've already done something like that. So let's try something else. Let's try, for example, which boards are large betting more often. So we'll check. And here we can see that Button splits up their strategy with lots of small sizes and sometimes, sometimes using these bigger sizes. So what I want to do instead of splitting it up into eight things is group it together a bit. So I want to isolate these larger bets, right? And again, in order to sort group sizes, you need to switch over to table mode. And here I'm going to sort by bet large. Which boards are betting large? All right. Well, it appears that nine and 10 high flops, rainbow, lush draw, and we'll notice that all of these have an open ender by the looks of it, right? Open ender, middling cards, not really seeing any monotone boards in here. Okay, let's go over the grouping to see if we can find some patterns there. So connectedness, connected boards tend to be betting large more often, same with open enders. Dry disconnected boards tend to bets, use a smaller bet size. Okay, good to know. What about pairing? Well, paired boards size down, so we don't want it to be paired. And what about suits? Monotone boards size down, we don't want that. All right, so we already got some filters here, so let's make it kind of draw heavy, something like that. So again, a flush dry helps open-ended or connected helps. And let's take a look at the chart and just scroll through the flops here. All right, so already we're seeing a lot more larger bets within our set of heuristics, but it's not super clean, right? Like Jack-8 deuce, even though, you know, an open-ender is possible, it's actually quite dry. So let's try something else. Let's try filtering by putting more middling cards in there. So I'm going to take, I want to make sure that the bottom two cards are kind of middling, right? Just as an idea. These actually result in more medium boards. Okay, okay. I'm going to sort this by high cards. And this is basically my process, right? Like I'm actively discovering these trends with you as we go through this, right? And so it looks like, for example, ace and jack high. So let's apply those two. And we've got kind of a heuristic here for larger bet sizes, right? We're betting medium or large more than we're betting small in these spots. So 
very simply, when the board is more draw heavy, more connected, you've got some more of these middling cards, open enders, maybe flush draws possible. That's when you want to start sizing up, right? And of course, you can improve this and make it cleaner. You can make it more strategically similar. But remember, the goal is often times to abstract the larger theory. And when you do this enough, you start to develop your own ideas of which boards want to size up for what reasons. So it's not just about memorization. It's about trying to find those underlying uh, cause effect mechanisms that make the thing want to size up. Now, I've already done a video on my theories behind seabed sizing and why certain textures prefer certain sizings. You can go watch that video on YouTube. Uh, this one's more about how to find these trends. So for example, you can group a lot of these ace, middle, middle cards together. These boards are very strategically similar. Um, you can do the same thing for a lot of these king high boards, right? Very strategically similar, despite the fact that it's splitting between small and large sizings. They're still very strategically similar. I want to go over one last thing before I wrap this up. And that is how to take these heuristics that you've built and train. So firstly, you want to use the turn reports, right? Now let's try something here. I'm going to open ace eight six. And so our heuristic now is going to be ace middle middle card, right? These boards typically start sizing up the deny draw equity, but they're also mixing smaller bets. Now, in order to get good at this, you can use a combination of finding thresholds through filtering. You can also use turn reports. So instead of picking one turn, if you have premium, click turns and you try and find reports. Here we can already see that, for example, an eight or a six, or even an ace, any paired card, really, we just look at pairing, going to be a high frequency donk bet by the big blind. And that's because big blind has more pairs in range after they call this large bet, right? Okay, so let's say big blind checks action on button. And we can kind of break it down here. So oh, we're noticing that we're kind of sizing down a little bit on a lot of these flush completing boards, right? So let's take a look. We're going to filter by suits. And again, we see the heart. When the flush completes, instead of using another big bet, we go from 76% to like 32 or 50%, right? But when it doesn't complete, we're often going to use something closer to a geometric size. So, right, 72%, 50%. And so you can use turn reports in this manner to figure out how to proceed overall. Again, I'm just going to change this back to the view I prefer. So again, look over here to see how your overall strategy should be. And then use a combination of grouping and sorting to find turn cards where the strategy shifts. You can also look at equity shifting runouts using the equity distribution. And I've already gone, gone over a lot of how the turn reports work earlier. Now, that's how you look at turns for follow through, but how do you actually play it out? Well, aside from actually studying the solutions, the other thing you need to do is actually practice them, right? So let's go ahead and practice this spot. Now, in the trainer, what you want to do is plug in your heuristic. And let's go change it up. So let's make it cash again. And we'll do six max general NL50 this time, sure. And let's apply some betting filter that we're familiar with, right? So hero can be, say, button. The opponent can be big blind. And here's where you plug in your filter. So. What's one filter we remember? Well, this one I have memorized. It looks something like this. So Ace, Broadway, Brick, not monotone. And again, this can't be paired. This type of texture, if you recall, results in high frequency overbets. And so we can practice strategically similar textures by plugging in these filters. And furthermore, you can save these filters. So I'm going to click Save. Going to call this overbet check and type in some description here. So button versus big blind, overbet boards, single race pot, something, any description so you can remember what's going on. Right. I've got this saved as a drill now, and I can practice specifically overbet 
supports, right? And oh, you know what? I better change that to a post flop spot because I forgot to do that. <laughs> flop single raise pot. There we go. Now we're starting on the flop on overbet boards, right? Ace Ace will often check in these spots, um, sometimes not. But either way, the goal is to find strategically similar boards, plug those textures into the trainer, and then actually practice from flop to river to get a sense of the follow through. In summary, firstly, learn how to use the tool. Next, optimize to try and find strategically similar flops that apply to a wide enough array of flops. Next, use some sort of system to write it down and record your observations. And it, it's not necessarily the fact that you have a giant spreadsheet filled out. It's the actual process of filling it out yourself that is helpful, right? And lastly, focus on follow through. Optimizing flop sizing is not as important as actually getting a sense to how to follow up on turn and river. The strategically similar flops tend to play somewhat similarly on later streets, especially when they're very similar. So focus on follow through. All right, that's it for the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed this content. Let us know down below what you'd like to see next. If you have any questions about aggregate reports or how you can use them, feel free to join our Discord and ask us there. Link in the description. That's all for now. Happy grinding.